Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. You're watching Consider This. Tonight on the show, I have joining me Dato Satina Saleh or Dato Satina Said Saleh, the Council Member of the National Education Advisory Council for the 2018 to 2020 session. Welcome to the show, Dato Satina. Thank you very much, you Marisa, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Tonight, we're going to be talking about education. You've got lots of experience in education, having started as a teacher. Uh, in La Salle, PJ, That's right. 1977, and you've you know, been in the ministry, you've held all these different positions. Now, uh, you're part of the National Education Advisory Council. And I kind of want to I want to understand what this council does in terms of its um, objectives. So it was set up uh, way back in 2010, but now it's looking at uh, as a consultancy role to the uh, Ministry of Education advisory role. Advisory role. Could yes. you mind? Would you mind elaborating yes. um, what it was initially set up for and what yes, it currently right. wants to achieve? All right. So uh, basically, uh, Melissa, the National Advisory Education Advisory Council, it is uh, set up under the purview of Education Act, Section 10. So it is not. Um, a creation of any minister for that matter. There is a provision in the Act, but depending on whether the minister would like to use that provision uh, to set up this council. Okay. So uh, in 2010, uh, the Ministry of Education somehow capitalized on the provision and they started creating this council. So there have been many um, individuals, experts, uh, I have lost count how many of them, <laughs> the different groups. And uh, so this is my first time, uh, basically, uh, after Pakatan Harapan took over mm -hmm. and uh, they invited me to be one of the 11. Actually, initially, there were only seven mm. uh, member councils in the, this, right. in the uh, group. So there's so 11 members? 11 members. There are 11 altogether. And um, the, actually, the council, we are actually we are experts in our own areas. So, for example, I'm an education expert, and I do policy a lot. And then we have our chairman, Tan Sri uh, Dato, Dr. Wan Muhammad Zahid, who was formerly the director general. His areas is also not only just management and leadership, but also on policy. Mm. Uh, as a matter of fact, I worked very closely with him that time. And uh, and then we have uh, people like Tan Sri Yong Pokong. Okay. He's actually an industry captain. But also very passionate about the education passionate. system and education reform. Indeed, mm -hmm. indeed. He is one man that should not have time at all, but he has time. So what, what I'm trying to put across, the level of commitment that uh, all 11 of us are you know, okay. having in uh, making this council, right. uh, advisory council, a working one. So what is the council's main role? What yes. does it hope to achieve? Yes, the first thing that uh, our role actually is to give independent um, uh, advice, um, opinions, even to a certain extent suggest problem solving to the Minister of Education. The government and Malaysia, but we work closely with the Minister of Education. So uh, in fact, as a matter of fact, we even have our own chat group. <laughs> so, so when, when for efficiency, we, yes, for efficiency, <laughs> and uh, and the minister is free to seek advice from us. Mm. Just for example, that he has some issues uh, on the ground, so they just say, "Oh, uh, Tansri, probably can we get the team to come and meet me?" So sometime, actually, with Dr. Mazi, last time that we met him, sometime at home, okay, in the evening, All just right. to have a chat, you know, and. Uh, at the same time, when, when you talk about education, education policy, because they are very much, very much into policy, mm. we will talk about the, the span of level, you know, from preschool, uh, K-12 education, meaning it's primary and secondary school, right until uh, higher education, okay. including um, technical, vocational. I mean, that, that span to me is Huge. amazing because it is a very, you know, it, that, yes. that range is big very and I big. think uh, many people forget often how right. much the education ministry has to actually look at. And this is of, of course after the education ministry has been combined into combined, one. Okay. Yes. okay, so because your background is uh, in education policy, I want to delve into that. I want to delve mm -hmm. deeper into the complexity of putting together education policy. Right. Now, um, Talk to me about that that range. So, is it broken down when you when you uh, crafting policy for education? Are you looking at you know preschool all the way till 
tertiary education as the scope of policy or is it broken down into right. these different age groups? Okay, actually um, in the Ministry of Education, even though they were, they are now one ministry, but we have two separate sort of a management. So we have the Director General of Education, the Ketua KPPM we call it, uh, in the Ministry of Education mean Kementerian Pelajaran, they call okay. it. He's taking care of schools. Then we also have a DG for the higher education that will take care of also polytechnics, uh, public universities especially, the 20 public universities and so on. So when we do policy, basically we focus, like my focus has always been looking at uh, policy of K-12 education. Okay. I use that nomenclature K-12 so that it was, it's easier for us to refer to K school. K-12 meaning primary to secondary? secondary. Okay. Yes, right. uh, yes, that's okay. right. So it, we, do, we don't do it together. Mm -hmm. We have to look at, I think, if, if, I think if you are aware, in the system of education, the most uh, sought after by parents, they, had, they have got their own views, actually when they are in school. Right, of course. I mean, that, yeah. that is... That is when parents have the most expectations That's from right. the education system and the, right. the teachers right. and also the, the children the as children, well yeah. uh, within that K-12 period. Right. Um, yeah. I want to delve deeper into that. So, um, you know, as, as this council it has an advisory role to mm. the Minister of Education, mm -hmm. what were some of the most recent advice right. you gave to the minister? Okay, actually... Um, I think many of us are educationists. Some of them are professors and expert subjects. Uh, I must mention first before I go further on what we're going to present to the Prime Minister or the Minister of Education the right now. Minister in the Acting Minister right of Education. <laughs> so what we have done, what we have achieved together with uh, for the last 20 over months, actually looking at the special needs children. Actually, the, the council actually played a very important role in even preparing the, the preparation of the guidelines. And uh, the previous minister, the former minister, in fact, uh, this is one of Dr. the Dr. biggest... Mazli. Yeah, Dr. Mazli. He was very passionate about this. Very passionate yes. about it, and he even implemented the policy of uh, zero reject policy. So now, if you have children, special needs children, you cannot reject them. You have to allow them to be enrolled in schools. Mm. So I, to me, I think that is amazing. Because we only sometimes worry about children in the urban area. Sure. We are worried about whether you are getting the right teachers or not. There are children in the rural area, in the far away places, when their basic needs are not meet, met. So like these special children, they have been neglected for a long, Falling long time. Falling through the cracks, yeah. right? And not enough with that as well. Some of them in the, because I used to teach in, Sarawa, in Sabah, and in Sarawak. So even our teachers were sleeping sometime in the classroom. Mm. In the night time and late and morning, they would just put them again as a classroom. I think this is one thing that we have been part of it together with, uh, you know, supporting Dr. Mazli, advising him, uh, whereby that teachers' uh, welfare must be taken care of. I think he built many schools, many, sort of a small, not school, many, um, Accommodation for teachers, mm. a small place like, like Roma Panjang or whatever it is, you know, and he repaired a lot of uh, dilapidated school. All right, I want to come area. back and talk about some of the right. successes, particularly uh, particularly about teacher quality, teacher welfare. Right, right. Let's continue this conversation shortly on Consider This. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. I'm chatting tonight to Datuk Satina Said Saleh, educationist and council member of the National Education Advisory Council. Um, now, just before the break, you touched on something really important, teacher quality and teacher welfare. You talked yes, about yeah. how the former education minister had done a lot in terms of improving uh, teacher welfare. I want you to elaborate a little bit on that because yes. I think that's really important, an important area of education reform which yes. is often not spoken about or given emphasis on teacher yes. professionalism teacher career opportunity advancement right. and welfare that's right um, one of the uh, initiatives that we're going to do based on all this information that we have collected uh, would be uh, 
looking at teacher quality and teacher professionalism. We're not even using the word teacher. We're going to talk about educators. Okay, so we're, we're moving away from we are the moving teacher away from teachers to into educator yes, educators. Okay. Because uh, teachers, once upon a time, we used to, teachers used to be like, when I'm my time, we used to provide gift information to my students. Mm -hmm. You know, you seek information, then you teach them in the classroom. Right. It's gone already. It's like days. ropes learning. Yes, right, okay. yeah. But nowadays, they can get the information at the, as, you know, at the tips of their fingers. They're so much smarter than yeah. we were. <laughs> so we need to sort of facilitate and educate them. Okay. How actually, for example, using information, in the, the best way of using information, okay. handling the information so that you will not be using the wrong information while you are learning and building yourself. So this changing role of mm. teachers or educators, right? It, it's no doubt it's changing. Right. Are our educators equipped for this, uh, for the changing role? Is the ministry aware and right. doing things to, you know, to allow teachers to evolve in this role? That's right. The ministry is definitely very aware of that mm. and it has been there for the last how many years. But the journey is very long, Melissa. You know, you can't transform the education system within a short time. Okay. So this is one of the reasons sometimes I got, I, I, know I felt very, very sad when people expect everything to be done within nine or, uh, and, uh, one year, mm. 20. It's not that, uh, you know, I'm blaming anybody. But I think we need to, be, to have a little bit of patience. Uh, but while we are preparing teachers, while we are trying to uh, equip teachers, to be able to play a role of facilitators and educators, the journey must continue. Can I just ask yeah. you, why does the journey take such a long time? What are some of the institutional challenges that right. cause this to take, that cause educational reform to take such a long time, long, time. long process? Why is it? So one of the things actually is mindset. Mindset? Mindset and comfort zone. Of? Because comfort zone of not only teachers uh -huh. but also at the same time the institution the people around that as well you know uh, I think just just for example if we are very happy with certain things that we do even personally mm -hmm. we are doing it the same way and we are getting results but we are not looking at what what's happening outside the world you know what's coming mm. so uh, that is quite a challenge because we also have teachers some of the teachers who are a bit you know they're not really open Right. Put this new development. Well, they've education. been doing things a, a certain way f yes. for a long time. long time. So change is always uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, yes. Okay, a and as um, an advisor mm. <laughs> to the <laughs> minister and the yes. ministry, yes. what would your advice be to change the mindset, to speed yes. the process along? I think uh, one thing that we have to do, uh, I, I, you know, you can see, Melissa, we all already passed our time. Actually, we are no longer, we don't have any more sort of ambition or something we want to achieve. But we do in the council, most of us, we have retired, most of us. So the only thing that we want to do actually is to see the system is going to be transformed. Mm. The children will get better education. Okay. Teachers will be uh, more exposed to new way of uh, educating our children. So these are the things that we are trying to do. So I think we need to, actually many of us, we go to school. Right. Actually, we talk to teachers. Okay, so you have on the ground exposure. Yes. You talk to the, to yes, the teachers yes. who are teaching classrooms yes. right now. We okay. have education with them. Right. So it is sort of a motivation as well so that they will be aware if you are not willing to change, if you want to be totally comfortable, you will be obsolete. Okay. You will, will be of no use, you know. Mm. I, I even give that example. I have to learn a lot of new things, right. despite of, you know, we are not young anymore, you know, but we need to, we need to do a lot of things, so, you see. So that's a qu another question, right? Is the fear of change coming from the fear of being ill-equipped, a lack of skill to, right. to yes. adopt to these, uh, to adapt to these new challenges? That's right. Or is it a certain dependency mm -mm. on receiving instruction from the ministry? So that hampers the way they want to teach perhaps more creatively. That's right, yes. Both a ways. bit of both? Ah, okay. Yes, a bit of both, okay. I would say. One, I think in town, in the rural area, urban area, it is a lot a lot easier to to get teachers to learn new things. Sure. Okay. But for teachers in the rural areas, you know, there are limit, very limited resources that we have. Mm. And the last few years has been quite difficult in terms of uh, budget as well. Okay. But uh, notwithstanding that, we are also playing quite a... Uh, uh, and I'm one of them actually together with my team, we are 
uh, very much championing the private public private partnership are there, are there yeah. dangers to allowing the private sector into our schools no okay. not personally because we have experienced it actually I'm but because I feel the private sectors they will be able to come in actually not only support in terms of financial but they also have the knowledge okay, can you elaborate a little bit when yes. you talk about private Public, public partnerships. Yes. What do you mean by that specifically to the education sector? Okay. Do you you still remember Melissa about the trust school program? Yes. The trust school program actually during that time I was still the education advisor to Kazana. Okay. Yeah. So we started in two zero one ten. Initially they had only ten school, five in uh, five in uh, Joho, five in Sarawak. They had people to fund. It wasn't cheap. It was. It cost millions, you know, yeah. to transform the whole school, the ecosystem of the school. But the problem that they, the challenges they had during that time, teachers not willing to to be part of it. Okay. Some of them, not all of them. But at the end of it, after two months, they were just like there for you because they feel, oh, I'm learning new things. I'm actually my children are very happy. My children are coming to school without me lecturing them tomorrow. Please finish your homework or whatever it is. So these are actually. It's already proven. So, so private sort of sector comes in with the financial, financial resources yes. and takes away that burden from the education ministry. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They okay. just do the topping up. Okay. They don't give cash to the school. They don't give money, but they upskill teachers. Okay. They do capacity buildings. All right. No? So, why is there such a hesitation to adopt a private public partnership for uh, the education system? There is not now. I think things have changed quite a bit, but I think the only thing that I have uh, mentioned uh, many times that I've mentioned to even to the Minister of Education as well. I personally, actually, because he told me, Satina, that to Satina, you are going to ch uh, champion this. So I'm passionate because I think after nine years now I've been outside so I do know how the private sectors are mm. working I could see that they are very genuine people mm. they are the people who, who are willing to give a lot for the sake of the children right it is not about them anymore it is about building up the is school. this part of their CSR, yes, okay. CSR. So, so there's yeah. real opportunity to tap the pu yes, private sector yes, for yeah. the benefit of our That's children right. okay wonderful. but the ministry need to structure them properly okay. you need to have a proper way of addressing them so that they would be able to come easily. I think sometimes they have issues with officers. This Bureaucr is the mindset again. Bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Okay. Yes, so bureaucracy yeah. has become a stumbling block, a stumbling block for certain. the private sector to want to participate That's right. in the education sector. I think we must always remember uh, now, education is not the sole, the government is not the sole owner of education. It is a sharing thing. Everybody wants to have a share in educating their children. So you can't say that Ministry of Education is the best in delivering education. No, not anymore. I love that. So education is not the sole, uh, the government is not the sole owner, owner. of yes. education. Educa yes. All right, we're going to be back <laughs> in just a couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us right here on Consider This. <laughs> Thanks for staying with me on Consider This. I'm speaking to educationist Dato Satina Said Saleh. Now, um, in as part of, as a council member of the National Education Advisory uh, Council, what are your what do you think are some of the real opportunities for education reform in Malaysia? Yes. The the, the most that you think the, uh, the biggest opportunity that we have. That's right. Here. I think first thing we have to put at what is happening now. Sure. It's everything is moving so fast. Mm. In 10 years time, in 20 years time, we don't know what type of job that will be available. So we know English actually is one of the, uh, the most important aspect that our students must be exposed. We want them to be well versed in English. I think this is the biggest issue in our country still. Mm -hmm. Because our sekolah kebangsaan, um, the graduates, even the, our public universities, some of them, they are not able to communicate well. So we talk about education, Melissa. At the end of it, one day, the contents will not be done by us anymore. Mm. You know, Jack Ma talked about it. Uval Harari talked about it. You know, what, what type of education will happen. But what we need to actually, uh, the opportunity that we need to do actually is to spend more time in giving values to, our, to the education. 
we need to emphasize the importance of values. We need to emphasize the, the opportunity to have open discussion. Right. The ownership between uh, ministry, teachers, students, and community, parents mm. as well. Mm. So at, at the end of it, this job of transforming education cannot be done by the Ministry of Education alone or higher education. It has to be done by parents. You know, we this is the biggest issue like Jawi recently. Right. You know, I personally believe you must teach uh, uh, Islamic education in the school, but you cannot be teaching the whole too many activities, Islamic uh, activities in our sekolah kebangsa and then will not be able to attract, for example, our non-Malay um, citizens to come in. Uh, these are the things that we feel we must have a school of choice. Sekolah Kebangsaan to become the school of choice. To become that, the school of choice. Yes, that okay. is my aspiration actually. And, and one one way of doing that, uh, I mean the different ways of doing that include yes. looking at the curriculum, looking at teacher quality yes. and the medium of yes. instruction as well. Language, language, language as can well. I, can I touch on um, English? Because you've been an educator for more than 30 years now, right? You've been, right. Within, you've been in the system, you've been outside of the system. Yes. The conversation about English has is a perennial conversation, one that we keep coming back to. Yes. And now we have the uh, acting education minister, our prime, our prime minister yes. is the ed <laughs> acting education minister. I'm sure this conversation will come back to the fore. Certainly, yeah. What, what do you make about now? Having yes. said that your position is that you want to see more English. Yes, uh, yes, mo yes. A, a better uh, understanding about Understand. the use command of, of, of the English, language, command yes, of English. Yeah. What do you make of the backlash towards, um, you know, the use of English or the the failure of certain policies to implement English as a, a teaching as a language in schools. Um, to be frank with you, Melissa, I am actually looking forward to seeing him, <laughs> wanting to hear from the Prime Minister and wanting us to also put forward what we want to say as mm. well. You know, I'm not talking about uh, medium, you know, English as medium for instruction. I'm talking about how we can actually have more English in school. This is my own personal more opinion. More English in school? Yes. In what way? You can have more periods, probably more subjects to be taught in English. Okay. You know, we have the DLP program, but because at the end of it, those that will be losing out will be the Malays from the rural areas. If we don't allow this, they will not be exposed to this. So we have done some sort of a um, kajian and some sort of survey. You know, ideas was one of them that did it, and right. I was also partly tank. involved here at the think tank. And the people in the rural area in Sabah, Sarawak, they want English. Are there enough teachers to implement this policy? Yes, that is actually our challenges. Okay. We don't have enough teachers, but when we don't have enough teachers, doesn't mean that we don't have to implement it. We have to do it, and at the same time, we go along in preparation as well. Okay. But now we have technology. Yeah. Once upon a time, when we did the PPSMI, it was it was not uh, working very well right. because uh, during that time we didn't have that much of technology even though they were given CDs and what not. Yeah, so, you know? so one of the uh, drawbacks of that was said that teachers couldn't adapt, yes, couldn't to, adapt. to the demand of you know, teaching That's English. Right, yeah. uh, so you're saying now technology has advanced to the point where that will help that the could, teachers yes, as a could tool? Be, yes, okay. as a tool but at the same time we must also prepare our teachers. It doesn't mean that we we just leave them, oh no, actually don't enough teachers, it doesn't matter. I, I had had a chat with the, the current Director General of Education. Mm. So I'm excited because I know that she's a brilliant girl, she's smart and she has vision and mission. We were together doing policy. Okay. So things that I think she would do that I, I am very much, uh, you know, going along with it, I think, allow the more implementation of teaching of English, mm. either DLP or DLP plus or whatever we want to call it, you know, uh, technology. But at the same time, we also prepare our teachers. Right, because they are the key, right? Capacity building is a must. The right. government sure. must spend enough money for human resource. Okay. Yeah? In the last minute that we have yes. left, Dr. Safina, can I just get your thoughts on the communication of these uh, reform, the reform agenda in the education policy uh, ministry to all the stakeholders, to parents, to students, to the educa uh, educators? Yes. Um, you know that. There's an impatient public out oh, there yeah. waiting for, uh, you know, reform of the education ministry. What That's thoughts right. do you have on that? The reform has been done gradually. Okay. You cannot totally reform anything within six months. So we have been at, the, the, at this journey. For us, the NEAC, 
We cannot actually uh, divulge everything now. Okay. We need to talk to the minister first. Right. We need to get that endorsement. Then it will be published. It will be open. And then we'll work on how do we do it best you know, for our children. So things are being done behind the scenes, but Indeed. unable to be communicated as yet Not because as yet. you need to review policies. Yes, yes. No knee-jerk reactions no, from no. the ministry. And we, that is a more, very important thing. And one more thing that I also would like to touch on, uh, on the Puppy SMI. People used to say, why is the, the Tun Mahadir keep on talking about it? Mm. Actually, being able to think in English is something as in learning the language itself. Being able to think, to in, think English in English is as important. Yes, because in the, in the future, you can't think certain things in different language because the language of the future, the language of whatever technology we have is all in English, mm. you know? And then secondly, we also, must look at the values. Agama, Islam, if that didn't actually, or values uh, or moral education, did not actually really, it was not totally successful, I must say. So we still, they learn agama, but at the same time, their practices, the practice is totally different thing. Right. Integrity. So embedding those key values. Ah, those key values, and education. also unity. Because in our country, we talk about unity as well, integration, social integration, which is, I'm very passionate about it. And digital learning is something else. Well, you know what? There's so many topics that we yeah. need to cover. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have yes. in this episode of Consider right. This. But we're going to keep the conversation about education reform going right here on this show. We hope you stay with us. I'm Melissa Idris signing off for tonight. Thank you for watching and good night. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes, that. Yeah.